If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to invite you to what should be a very informative program. I'm joined here by my guest in studio, Steve Morrison. Steve, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Larry. Steve is our Director of Research for Christian Answers. He also runs our excellent uh, uh, internet uh, sites, BibleQuery.org and HistoryCart.com. You also have another one, which gets, uh, I think you said, quite a few hits a month, uh, mm -hmm. called uh, uh, MuslimHope.com, which deals with the Islamic religion. So if you're interested in uh, this type of research, feel free to check those sites out. And of course, we'll have more information about that in our shows. But now, uh, for this particular uh, program, we're going to be covering early church history. This is show number one in a series we'll be doing. And to uh, preface this, let me just state the following, and you'll be able to see it on your chart at home. Most of our shows are about what is all true or else what counterfeit spiritual groups teach that we believe is wrong. This series of shows is a little different. It is documenting what a group, the consensus of early Christian writers believed, regardless of whether we agree or disagree. Okay, so with that premise established, we're going to be covering what the early church fathers, the early church itself, taught about different doctrines and beliefs related to the Christian faith. And from that, we will analyze then from what they are telling us to more current issues in the, the Christian church or as they relate to other groups, uh, uh, I mentioned already from uh, Steve's websites about uh, Islam, uh, the Bible, things of that nature. We'll find out how they correlate to these issues. Okay, with that said, we're going to begin with the pre nicaea evidence of what early Christians taught. This is part one, the approach. Did you ever wonder what the early Christian church taught? They lived in a different time, a different culture, and struggled against different issues than many Christians do today. But they had the same truth of the gospel. We can know what they believe by the over 4,100 pages they wrote that we have preserved. Most of the references are online at www.ccel.org. We also recommend purchasing anti nicene Fathers, Volumes 1 through 10, edited by Alexander Roberts and James Donaldson, uh, published by Hendrickson Publishers, 1994. For most writers, the page numbers are from this series. How to tell? There are hundreds of pages of some writers and less than a page of others. How would you define, quote, generally agreed, end quote, early Christian teaching? Of course, Gnostics, Ebionites, Sabellians, and others were separate groups with different doctrines. But we are focusing on what the Christian churches agreed upon. But what is agreement? And, and, and Larry, the issue here is how do you objectively show what they taught? 
and because you don't want to either consciously or unconsciously just be projecting your own beliefs back to them. Uh, for example, what if a single eccentric guy in one place taught something? Can you call that a consensus of what the early Christians believed, you know, even if you liked what he said? On the other hand, what if uh, ten or more writers all said the same thing and none denied it? You know, are you right to ignore that as a consensus of what they believe if you don't agree with it? So we need to have some objective standard um, that, that, that we can uh, use. And so for the standard that, uh, that I've chosen, of all the early pre-Nicene writers, and there are about 82 of them, uh, prior and, and Nicaea was in 325 AD, uh, I call it a generally agreed upon doctrine if four or more writers agreed to it and none denied it. Now, while early Christians weren't perfect, just like Christians today aren't perfect, uh, we can really see what it is that, that, that they uh, studied and that they taught uh, and the faith that they died for. And, of course, many of these guys, the New Testament Greek was their native language, especially in the East, um, and they dreamed in that language. And so we can see how did they look at the Bible that, that we have today. Uh, we can also discover um, doctrines that are already in the Bible, but they may, um, maybe we're kind of neglecting them today and we're looking at them. And also we can look at things that we kind of, some people kind of take for granted that early Christians taught, but actually the early Christian uh, uh, tradition doesn't, didn't teach at all. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look through, if we, if we didn't have any Bibles, if all we had were the early Christian writers, what could we say about Christianity? Now, when I show this to, have shown this to Christians, I get two different responses, and both of them are actually valid. The other is kind of a um, ho-hum, so what response. It's like, well, what truths are, essential truths are you going to learn that aren't are in the Bible? And the answer is none whatsoever. Um, there are maybe a few errors we might disagree with, but there's no truth there. And so if you're looking for truth, uh, to find truth, you know, the Bible is all you need. Uh, other Christians seem very excited about this because while it doesn't show any new truth, it shows evidence that the same thing that we believe now is the same thing that, that they believed back then, and it, and it documents this in an objective manner. Uh, so we're going to look at this and say, well, what can we establish they taught, and what can we not establish? Now, I'll say that sometimes it's difficult to count because they might have, you know, let's say the same thing, use a slightly different word, uh, and my numbers that I give might be slightly off. But I, I think that overall my uh, numbers are, total numbers are accurate within about at least 4%. So, uh, so, so uh, we're going to look and see what, you know, what they have. All right. Now we're going to be looking at an uh, early Christian theology roadmap, you might say. There are many admirable people during the time of the early pre-Nicene church, but there are some real characters too. Before we get into what they taught, we are going to introduce briefly a who's who of some of the people. We will hear some alternate viewpoints also. All right, Steve, let us... Uh, begin with some of their earliest writers and move on move along this road map okay well, one one of the earliest writers was uh, Clement of Rome and of Rome to distinguish him from a later person named Clement and he wrote about 97 98 AD now this is actually earlier than some people think that John finished the book of Revelation so he was you know uh, right at, at the tail end or, or the time that the Bible was written and uh, he, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, and you could kind of sum up his letter as, uh, why, didn't you do the, why aren't you doing the things Paul told you to do 50 years ago? And uh, he wrote extensively about the blood of Christ and uh, the atonement, and he quoted a lot from the book of, of Hebrews. And he was a, a, a good writer. The only quibble I have about him is that he used the phoenix bird of Arabia, which died every thousand years and was reborn, as a natural illustration to, to point to the resurrection of Christ. And that's a nice illustration, except the phoenix bird didn't really exist, and we don't think that Clement knew that. So he wasn't perfect. But, uh, you know, uh, and there is a Clement mentioned in Philippians 4.3. Whether that's the same Clement as, the, as this Clement of Rome or not, uh, we really don't know. Uh, moving on, there is Ignatius. Now, Ignatius, uh, the early writers loved to quote scripture. Ignatius probably quoted scripture a little bit less than some of the others. 
uh, you can sort of understand because his uh, teacher and disciple was the Apostle John. And you can imagine somebody, you know, arguing about um, some point and he said, well, let me go and see what my disciples said. <laughs> you know, and he says, you know, and if John says, that would kind of settle it pretty much. Um, so prior to um, the, the, the death of the apostles, you know, Christianity was a little bit different. They didn't have, you know, all the books of the Bible for the first few decades, but they did have the apostles that they could go with. And today we often say, at least as Protestants, that, uh, you know, that the Bible is the ultimate source of authority. Well, really, that's not quite true. Really, the ultimate source of authority is God. It's not the tradition. It's not the Pope. It's not, actually, it's not the Bible either. It's God. But we can tell what God said by His Word. But when they didn't have all of the Scripture, um, they did have the truth that they had uh, preserved by the apostles. And as they died, um, then, you know, we have, have their writings. So, uh, move, moving on, there were lots of persecutions that you can see on the chart. Uh, Trajan persecuted Christians, Hadrian persecuted Christians. We have the letter of Barnabas, um, which is sometimes confused uh, by some Muslims with a medieval forgery called the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a totally different thing. But the letter of Barnabas, we don't know who, which Barnabas this was. Was this a Barnabas and Acts? Was this a different Barnabas? But it's generally a um, pretty good book. Um, and, and, and moving on, we have Second Clement, and the writer of Second Clement never identifies who he was. But some people had thought in the past that this might be the same Clement as the Clement of Rome, so that's why it's called that. But the book never actually says that it's the same Clement, or even if it is a person named Clement at all. Okay. Uh, then, uh, uh, moving on, we get to Polycarp and Papias. Now, Polycarp and Papias, they were both also disciples of the Apostle John. And Papias wrote about five volumes worth of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of it has been lost, except for a few fragments preserved by Eusebius. Uh, Polycarp uh, was a, a, a martyr. Um, he was asked to say, uh, away with atheists. Uh, Christians were called atheists, which sounds kind of contradictory, because they did not believe in all the Roman gods. But in the fact they believed in only one God uh, didn't really count. They were still called atheists. So he would say that. And they asked him to deny Christ. And he refused. And so um, and, and, uh, he was burned uh, to death. Uh, but most of these Christian writers, many of them uh, not only taught their faith, but they also died for their faith. Um, and the, these early fathers are kind of called the apostolic fathers after this time. After this time was a... Uh, a philosopher named Justin who uh, became a Christian or as he put it he uh, found the true philosophy and uh, some people see some influence of I guess Greek philosophy coming into some of the early church teachings uh, many of them had a lot of respect for the Greek philosophers on the other hand some of them said that what they wrote was not all wrong but some of them said that some of it was good and bad and it was very popular for example for early Christians to quote from Plato's work the Timaeus uh, also to quote from Homer and from others, just to show that the Greek philosophers had some inkling that there was only one God uh, and, and against the idolatry. And those are kind of, I guess, evangelism methods that we generally do not use today, but they lived in a different time. Um, they, uh, Justin Martyr uh, had a disciple um, named Tatian. And uh, Tatian, uh, after Justin died, Tatian went bad. He started a group, or was actually influential in a group, called the Ancretite Gnostics. And it was during this time um, that, the, that a competitor to Christianity, which later branched out into almost 30 different groups called the Gnostics, um, were started. Wait a second. With all of these interruptions, how can the listeners hear what the early church really taught? Well, we need to have some way of knowing if there's any credence to the Gnostics or not. Think about this. A basic fact that many people have seemed to have forgotten is Jesus was Jewish. Jesus, he quoted from the Old Testament. He respected the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus um, said the Old Testament prophesied about him. And as the early church father said in discussing about Gnostics, how could the God of the Old Testament be either an evil God or else a foolish God and yet would prophesy so much about the one who would undo all his work? And, and, the, and, and so there is uh, no way that, that Jesus could be against the God of the Old Testament because of his quoting and, and everything else. 
And yet that's exactly what Gnostics said. Gnostics said that the, uh, that the created material world was bad, the creator was either evil in some groups or foolish in other groups, and, that, and, and he was the same God as the God of the Old Testament, and they wanted to basically uh, strip all the Jewishness from Jesus uh, it, the, when, when actually, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, gave us a lot of respect, you know, and even today Christians, you know, respect and, and follow a lot of the Old Testament. Okay. So, moving along, we're, we're going to see the first near schism in the church. Um, there were people in the East called uh, Melito of Sardis uh, was one, and there were others who were called Court of Decimians. And the dispute was over when should Easter be celebrated? Should it be Easter celebrated identical to when Jewish people celebrated Passover? Or should it be celebrated kind of once a year from when uh, Christ died? And uh, they, they finally, under Hippolytus, uh, they agreed to disagree, but eventually they, the latter view that, that it would be celebrated like annually after Christ died uh, prevailed. But this shows, for example, that they celebrated Easter even from the very earliest times, despite what some modern people and cults might want to tell us. All right, Steve, that was a good uh, initial introductory, uh, you know, I guess, uh, way of presenting what all these different groups had to say, and then, then, uh, then, of course, the early church fathers and what they had to say in response to some of that. But, of course, we're just beginning. We're just mm -hmm. beginning in this. We're going to go into a lot more detail as we move through this early church situation to find out how uh, it related not only to all these Gnostic groups, uh, other cultic uh, ideas about uh, Christianity, but uh, how it relates to us as Christians today uh, and our beliefs. As Steve said at the beginning of the show, uh, what the early church teaches is what we today in modern times also believe. It's the faith held down through the ages, which of course many groups would deny, and that's one reason we're doing this show. Well, with that, Steve, we're going to sign off for now. Uh, do you have any last comment to make? Because we're uh, going to go in the series. Like you said, we're just getting started. That's uh, right. <laughs> we're, we're going to face the introductions, and we're going to go through exactly what they affirmed and what they did not affirm. All right. With that said, we're going to have to sign off for now. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. I'm the director. Steve Morrison is our director of research for Christian Answers. Uh, it was his painstaking research that you were getting to experience in this series. He did the work. And if you have any other information or you need any other information, or just contact our ministry. The numbers, email, all that stuff is right there for you. We're glad to help. God bless you all. Join us next time. Check out our video on YouTube entitled, Early Christian Church History Proves Roman Catholicism False. Please see other related videos on our YouTube channel, See Answers TV, or just type Larry Wessels in the YouTube search box. Welcome to Christian Answers, an outreach of Christian Answers, a nationwide apologetics ministry dedicated to contending for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints, dedicated to giving Christian answers. Glad you've joined us for the program today. I'm Lee Meckley, Director of Radio Outreach for Christian Answers, and I have really been looking forward to this program. Uh, this is a program that um, I hope you will be able to catch all of the, the details that we'll be discussing. Uh, we're going to be talking about Roman Catholicism uh, again, but it's, uh, again, this is um, something you've heard me say before, that we are uh, taking an approach that quite often is neglected uh, when this subject is discussed. But, uh, uh, again, if you will uh, simply hear us out and not simply turn this off as just another uh, polemic uh, about uh, Roman Catholicism, I, I think you will find this, uh, I think you will find this a very convincing discussion, whether you yourself are Roman Catholic, you have friends in the Roman Catholic Church, or you're simply interested in uh, church history and interested in uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are going to be talking today with uh, William Webster about a book that he has written called The Church of Rome at the Bar of History, published by by, uh, uh, by a banner of truth uh, publishers. And William Webster is a businessman uh, living with his wife and children in Battleground, Washington. Uh, he is the author of two other books, The Christian, Following Christ as Lord and Salvation, and The Bible and Roman Catholicism. 
Uh, William Webster is the founder of Christian Resources Incorporated and himself is a former Roman Catholic. Uh, William, thank you very much for uh, joining us for the program uh, today. Thank you, Lee. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wanted to uh, begin the conversation, I guess, by giving you an opportunity to talk about um, uh, your experiences in the Roman Catholic Church and what caused you to uh, come to the convictions that you have now? I was raised uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, I was raised in the South, in Tennessee. I went to parochial schools all through grade school. I was uh, sent away from home when I was 13 to attend a, uh, a high school that was run by a Benedictine monastery in Rhode Island. I had a, a terrible time adjusting to that school, but uh, eventually I did uh, feel at home there. Although by the time I got to the age of, I guess, around 16 or so, I began to really uh, have some philosophical difficulties with the whole issue of Christianity. Uh, I began to really question the whole basis upon which uh, Christianity was formulated. and. It, the gist of it was that by the time I was 18, I had, for all practical purposes, become an agnostic. Uh, the experience that I had uh, as a Roman Catholic in the high school was not a particularly good experience. Uh, it, it certainly did not uh, engender in me a desire to be a Christian. I uh, left that school and attended Southern Methodist University in Dallas uh, when I went to college. Uh, throughout my experience there, I uh, was basically asking the same types of questions that I had uh, begun to ask about my sophomore year in high school and found that I could not find satisfactory answers. I, I did not carte blanche except by faith the authority of the church, the authority of scripture, any of the basic reasons that I had been given in the past that I should be a Christian. Uh, I turned my back on all of that and basically wholesale went into the world. And it's very clear that I was not converted. I did not know Christ. I was not a Christian. I simply had a form of religion. I, I should say that I w had been very devout as a Roman Catholic at one point. Uh, I used to attend Mass on my own. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I would get up early, ride my bike uh, to go to Mass before I went to school. I was an altar boy uh, before the Latin Mass was changed to English. But be that as it may, when I got into my college experience, uh, it led me uh, in, a, in a very frustrating search for what I thought would be truth. Uh, it was from a philosophical standpoint. I could not find answers. It was after my college experience I was... Uh, basically had the ambition of being a songwriter and I was involved in a, a small music group that I began to really seek the Lord. Now this came about as uh, out of a very strange experience because I came face to face with the occult and having rejected any uh, idea that there is a spiritual dimension to life I was pretty basically pretty much a materialist. I uh, in, in coming face to face with this this uh, reality, because it is very real, I had no categories for this. I did not know what to do with this. It was obviously spiritual in nature, and I concluded that if there is literally a spiritual dimension to reality, there must be a God. So I began to seek the Lord uh, as best I knew how, and I began to get back into the scriptures. Uh, a uh, pastor in Washington State gave me some tapes by Walter Martin dealing with the occult, and it was through his tapes and through my own exposure to the Word of God that I was converted and was brought to Christ. I was truly converted. My life was fundamentally radically changed because I came face to face with the reality of Jesus Christ and realized that he is not just a, a, a person of theology, uh, a myth. He's a living person. He's the living God. And I committed my life to him. And the Lord very graciously uh, changed my life and saved me and converted me.
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 